Hello, and welcome back to Drinking About Birds, finally. We were on a bit of an unplanned hiatus for about six weeks there, um, but we are back, and we're ready to talk about birds and wine again, and we're kicking off this week with this Zinfandel from Lava Cap Winery in California, which is illustrated with this lovely Stellar's Jay. And I know I said a couple of episodes back that we were going to focus mostly on the ecology of birds uh, in this series. Uh, I'm going to throw that kind of out the window for this episode because the Stellar's Jay, as you can tell, is a bird, one of many birds, that have these eponymous names. They are named after specific individual humans. Birds get their quote-unquote official names when they are first formally described in the scientific literature. Um, nowadays, this just happens in journals somewhere that nobody reads, or people read it, but I'm just being mean. But back in the day, uh, this was kind of a big undertaking. You had these giant compendia like Systema Naturae that was published by uh, Carl Linnaeus that was really ambitiously intended as sort of a compendium of all life on Earth as, as it was understood at that time. When formal descriptions of birds would appear, uh, they would be assigned a scientific and a common name, and sometimes those scientific or common names, or both, would be intended to honor a specific individual, often because uh, it was the person who first discovered it in a way that was considered valid by the taxonomists. So uh, the word discovered merits some huge scare quotes in this use. Obviously this glosses over indigenous knowledge, like there are very few places on earth that have been uh, historically never inhabited, and so anywhere that Europeans might go and find birds that they had never seen before, there would also be human beings who had been living alongside those species for generations and would just be intimately familiar with them just from daily life. But the taxonomists uh, would consider that knowledge to be invalid or not worth writing about because it wasn't written down and they didn't go out of their way to fit it into a Eurocentric system of uh, cataloging and taxonomy, which is kind of bullshit. But ornithology as it exists today is still descended from that uh, very Eurocentric tradition. And so the official record that we have today still maintains that all these species were discovered by uh, the first European person who shot one. The side effect of that is when you look into why a bird is named after a specific person, you wind up getting kind of a history lesson. And often the history behind it is just incredibly boring and mundane, like naturalists back in the day were known often to just name birds after their friends. So like uh, John James Audubon named a warbler after William McGillivray because they were friends, and that's why we have McGillivray's warbler. But sometimes there is actually some cool, interesting history behind it. Steller's J is named after Georg Wilhelm Steller, who was a German physician and naturalist who worked for the Russian Empire in the 18th century. Uh, he was born in Germany. He emigrated to Russia in the 1730s. Um, he was originally named Georg Wilhelm Stoller, but he changed his name to Steller because he noticed that Russians were having difficulty pronouncing his name, which is kind of a common immigrant experience. Um, but he wound up working as a naturalist. So in the early 18th century, Russia was doing a lot of exploration, a lot of uh, scientific endeavors. Uh, Tsar Peter the Great had this idea that he wanted to modernize Russia and make it less traditional and more like other powers in Western Europe. And part of that was he wanted it to be a scientific uh, power. And he also founded the Imperial Russian Navy. And so he wound up with the desire and the ability to set up these expeditions to different parts of the world. One undertaking that sort of grew out of this was the Great Northern Expedition, which is also known as the Second Kamchatka Expedition. Um, if you've played Risk before, you know where Kamchatka is. It is a peninsula in eastern Russia on the Pacific Ocean, and it's really quite a remote part of the world. And so there was a lot that was unknown about it as far as the Russian state was concerned. So the First and second Kamchatka expeditions were commissioned by Tsar Peter the Great, started shortly before his death in 1725, and it extended through 1742, roughly. Uh, so most of it was actually overseen by uh, Empress Anna, but the 
purpose of the first expedition was to try and figure out if there was a land bridge connecting eastern Russia to North America. It was not a success, it was kind of a modest undertaking, and uh, a couple years later, uh, Vitas Bering, who had led the first expedition, proposed a much more ambitious one. It took place between 1733 and 1742, so uh, a span of years. There were a lot of people involved. There were a number of independent sea voyages uh, that were kind of grouped in as part of this. The specific voyage that we are concerned about here was captained by Vitas Bering. It was aboard the ships St. Peter and St. Paul. The purpose of this was actually to see if they could reach North America. They hadn't found the land bridge in the previous expedition, and at this point it was kind of assumed that there wasn't one, but they wanted to see you know, how far did you have to actually sail to get to North America. So the St. Peter and the St. Paul sailed east from Kamchatka in 1741. They were almost immediately separated by fog, and so we're really only going to follow the St. Peter. Uh, aboard the St. Peter was Georg Wilhelm Steller, who was the ship's naturalist and physician at the time. Uh, the captain, Vitas Bering, was not in super great health, and he wanted to have an actual physician on board. Uh, as opposed to a ship surgeon, which in those days was basically someone who could you know, saw off someone's leg if it became gangrenous. So having an actual physician on board was definitely a plus, and he was a very committed naturalist, and so he could catalog sort of the plants and animals and minerals and ocean currents and all the other uh, natural phenomena that they encountered. Back then, uh, naturalists were much less specialized than they are now. Um, they were sort of expected to have a great breadth of knowledge about all sorts of natural phenomena. And anyway, they sailed straight east for a good long time. Uh, they did not have great weather. Uh, this voyage, depending on how you look at it, was sort of an exciting adventure or sort of a grim saga. Um, the crew suffered greatly from scurvy, which was not really understood at the time. By the end of the voyage, something like 32 out of the 78 men on board had died of scurvy, so it was like a 40% casualty rate just from scurvy alone. So uh, sort of grim and brutal in the way that only 18th century maritime voyages could be. But anyway, they sort of sailed aimlessly across the Pacific for, for quite a long time. Steller was sort of urging the captain that they should be sailing more northeast, uh, just based on his interpretation of sea currents and uh, flotsam and jetsam that they were spotting. They did eventually turn to the northeast, and after some sailing, they spotted a mountain peak in the distance. This turned out to be Mount St. Elias, which is on the Alaskan mainland, and they wound up anchored off the coast of an island that is now called Kayak Island. It's about 200 miles east-southeast of what is now Anchorage. They wanted to do some exploring on this island, at least Stellar did, but uh, the captain really wanted to turn back towards Russia by this point. Like, it had not been a good voyage, a lot of the crew was sick, um, the captain himself was not in super good health, and so he really wanted to just get back to Russia quickly. So what they ended up doing was spending one day anchored off this island. The crew spent the time provisioning, so just kind of gathering fresh water and anything else that might be edible. Uh, Georg Wilhelm Steller spent that time hiking around the island, collecting specimens of plants and animals, and uh, making notes, making observations on just the flora and fauna of this place. And in the course of his hiking, he noticed these blue birds. He found them very interesting because they reminded him of illustrations that he had seen of the blue jay. Now, the Blue Jay is very conspicuous in eastern North America, which had already been settled for hundreds of years by Europeans at this point. And so Blue Jays were pretty well known to European naturalists. He deduced from that fact uh, that they had actually reached North America, which is pretty good considering that he had never seen a Blue Jay in real life. And it's also pretty good considering that Stellar's Jay is extremely related to the Blue Jay. So he collected a specimen of this jay, and after about 10 hours just exploring this island, everyone got back on the ship and they headed back west. So it was July of 1741 that they were on Kayak Island. In November of 1741, they were shipwrecked on an island uh, that is off the coast of Kamchatka, about 100 miles off the coast. Um, that island is now called Bering Island because uh, Captain Bering actually died there in December, and 
they were shipwrecked and stranded on this island for the better part of a year. It was like eight or nine months that they were there. The ship was more or less destroyed, but parts of it were salvageable. They wound up just surviving on this island, uh, living off the land, more or less, uh, and living off the sea as well, because there were seals and things that they hunted for meat. In the spring, they managed to salvage uh, some pieces of the wreck of the St. Peter and used it to build a new boat that they named the Bering. Uh, and they, in August of 1742, finally managed to sail that new ship uh, back to Kamchatka and uh, rejoin the rest of civilization, more or less. Because the new boat was so much smaller than the original ship, uh, Steller was not able to bring along any of the specimens that he had collected, but he brought back his journal, he brought back some notes, and those were disseminated into the rest of Europe. And finally, uh, Steller's J was described uh, partly based on his notes uh, by Johann Friedrich Gmelin, who took over publishing the Systema Naturae after Carl Linnaeus died, uh, and that was in 1788, I believe. Georg Wilhelm Steller actually wound up having quite a few plants and animals named after him, uh, many of which he documented on this same voyage. So there is the Steller's sea eagle, which is pretty closely related to the bald eagle. There is the Steller's sea lion, which is the largest of the eared seals. There is the Steller's eider, which is a sea duck. There is the Steller's sea cow, which was a very large Cyrenian, so kind of similar to a manatee, but emphasis on was. Uh, so Steller was the first one to document this uh, species scientifically, and within about 30 years of it becoming known to science, it had been hunted to extinction. Pretty sad story uh, with that one. But he also, he was, like I said, quite a well-rounded naturalist, and so he wound up uh, documenting various species of plants and other animals like fish and invertebrates uh, that we're not really going to get into because uh, I'm a bird guy. So so Steller's J, as Steller himself observed, is very similar to the blue jay that is so common in eastern North America. They are very closely related. They're the only two members of their genus, which is Cyanocita. Jays make up part of the family Corvidae, which is an order of passerine birds uh, that also includes crows, ravens, magpies, uh, rooks, jackdaws, uh, various other representatives. They are typically sort of social, uh, fairly noisy. Uh, they, members of Corvidae uh, are ranked often as among the most intelligent of bird species. Uh, Stellar's jay, if you live in eastern North America, uh, you've probably never seen one. If you live in parts of western North America, you're probably intimately familiar with them because they are pretty uh, common and familiar birds. Um, they have kind of an interesting distribution. Uh, along the coast, they are mostly found in uh, coniferous forests, and they're found across a whole range of elevations, but they're found in interior North America as well, uh, as far south as like Nicaragua even. But in interior North America, they are more of an alpine species. They are found from a thousand meters up to maybe 3,500 meters. Uh, and this is something that we haven't really talked about before, but elevation can be a fairly important component of uh, describing a bird's distribution because climate changes pretty dramatically with elevation uh, where there is a big range. They are basically non-migratory in a geographic sense, but birds that are found at higher elevations during the winter uh, will migrate downslope uh, to lower elevations, and that's a pretty common form of migration, this sort of elevational migration where they stay in one place geographically but move up or down the mountainside in search of favorable weather or uh, better food availability. Steller's jay is basically omnivorous, uh, like many jays are, uh, which means they subsist on fruits and nuts and seeds, but also uh, invertebrates, small vertebrates. Uh, opportunistically, they'll eat like eggs and nestlings of other birds. Uh, a lot of people in Western North America know them as sort of a backyard feeder bird. They are quite vocal uh, and frankly noisy, as many other corvids are. They're excellent mimics. Uh, they're very good at imitating calls of other birds, especially raptors. Uh, they have a pretty huge vocal repertoire, but a lot of their calls are ones that you're only going to hear if you're really close, and they're sort of soft and uh, more melodious. Uh, 
the ones that you'll hear more often just because they carry much farther is these sort of scolding calls. Um, they have uh, one that's a short series of sort of raspy screeches like wah, wah, wah. And they have another one uh, that's a more rapid sort of chatter, like whack, 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 whack. Uh, yeah. Both of those will be familiar to you if you've spent time in the woods in the Pacific Northwest. But uh, yeah, like I said, they're not the only calls that they do, but they're the ones that I'm most familiar with. So uh, take that for what it's worth. And this is obviously a very handsome and recognizable bird based on the plumage. Uh, they have this lovely blue coloration uh, with the transition to black or dark brown on the head. They have this recognizable crest, which I like to think of as a speed fin. Um, and they do very closely resemble blue jays. Um, you can think of them as sort of the, uh, the blue jays goth cousin who works at the mall. But, so uh, Stellar's jay was first formally described in 1788 by Gamelin. Uh, about 40 years later, in 1828, is when this specific illustration first appeared. Uh, it was published in a book called American Ornithology, which was written by Charles Lucien Bonaparte, who was uh, Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte's nephew. He uh, was a big bird guy. And that work was sort of an update and an expansion of Alexander Wilson's uh, previous multi-volume work uh, of the same name. Uh, Wilson died before he could complete the work, and so Bonaparte uh, sort of took over, and so you often see them credited as co-authors on that. Uh, the illustration itself, as far as I can tell, was done by one Alexander Ryder, who was not really like a famous artist or anything, but he was an illustrator whom uh, Bonaparte worked with on this project. They claim that it was drawn from nature by Ryder, that's what the caption of the illustration says, um, but I believe they actually used a specimen of this bird that they borrowed from somebody who was living in London at the time. So they shipped a dead bird across the ocean to make this illustration uh, and then shipped it back when they were done. So that's just kind of, kind of how business was done uh, in the 19th century. So talking about this wine, I really love this label. Uh, it's very simple and effective. You know, one could argue that they're sort of cheating by using a historic illustration because it means they don't have to pay an artist or pay licensing fees or anything, but I can't really argue with that when it looks this good. And uh, they definitely get points from me for correctly identifying the bird uh, on the rear of the label. This is a Zinfandel uh, from California. It is made in the uh, El Dorado sub-region of the Sierra Foothills uh, winemaking region, which is a high elevation region and you get sort of the uh, benefit of the cooler climates that you find higher up on mountain slopes. Zinfandel is kind of an interesting case. Uh, it's a grape that's been uh, grown for quite a long time. Recently, since about the 1970s, it is often found in the form of white Zinfandel, which is actually a, uh, a rosé or a blush wine that was pioneered by Sutter Home Winery. Um, but there's also the varietal version, uh, which is what this is, where you make a uh, full-on red wine, and they tend to be sort of intensely fruity, and uh, this one certainly is. It's got a ton of fruit flavor in there. Uh, it's also got sort of a peppery character, which I really like. I found this label online, and I uh, actually drove to Pennsylvania uh, to get a bottle, so that is how smitten I was with it, and I'm really glad I did. It's quite tasty, but uh, just because of the inconvenience factor, I probably won't be drinking more of it anytime soon, which is a shame. So that's all I have uh, for this episode this week. Uh, thank you for watching. My name is Zach, and this has been Drinking About Birds, and uh, I hope to see you next time, whenever that is. So take care.